today on the podcast, we've got L. Russ, author of The Paleothyroid Solution. And we're going to discuss misconceptions about going paleo, why alcohol is such a huge no-no, and why the paleothyroid solution just might be the right solution for you on today's Peak Performers Podcast. Welcome to this edition of Peak Peak Performers Performers Podcast Podcast. with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak peak performer performer in any area area of of your your life life or business. Tell us about the thyroid. What, you know, here we are, the audience sitting out here. How do we know if our thyroid's doing what it's supposed to be doing or not doing what it's supposed to be doing? How do we check it? How do we, where do we go from here? You've given us this great information. What do we need to do? Sure. Actually, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind, though, getting into what you did ask me and I didn't really answer, which is defining kind of paleo yes, and what yes. that really means yeah. for people. Because I think that let's, I'd rather you start there just because I know that that's a curiosity thing for a lot of people. So there are so many misconceptions about, first of all, paleo, primal, ancestral health, evolutionary health. They're all sort of the same thing. People in the paleoprimal world might look at primal, which is really kind of a term coined by Marxist and primal blueprint, where he's more relaxed in terms of, hey, if all you can do is 80%, like an 80-20 paradigm, that's better than most people, right? So if that's all you can do, <clears throat> he's more a little bit maybe more lenient, like you can have an occasional dairy or chocolate or uh, and then there's some strict primal people that just no way would they do that at all. They'll have zero dairy, zero cheats, and it's 100%. None of them mean that. That's just sort of you can either be super strict or not. But at the end of the day, I already mentioned that it's aligned with our genetics. As human beings, we are carnivores, omnivores, but we're really mostly carnivores. So we're really not – I guess what I should say is there's no such thing as a human being being inherently a vegetarian or vegan, if that makes sense. The moment we look at food and we're ready to eat, our bodies produce hydrochloric acid to break down meat. (laughs) So, so, and other animals don't, don't necessarily do that. So there's lots of mechanisms we look at our digestive system and that of a, you know, a lion, et cetera. And we are meant and designed to consume animals and their flesh. It doesn't mean you need to eat meat. One of the biggest misconceptions, like you said, is everyone says this to me too. Oh, paleo, that's like, just eat a lot of meat. No, it's not. In fact, It's the opposite. It's moderate protein because when you overeat protein, it turns into glucose, which can keep you on a sugar burning train. So that's one one area where people are confused. The other area is this. They'll look at a paleo primal food list and they'll go, okay, great. And then they eat from that. And then they're like, I'm struggling or whatever. And they're doing something wrong. And here's where the I'm doing something wrong comes in. They're missing one of a couple of things. A, they're missing the carb component. There's still fruit on a paleo primal list, right? But if you eat a ton of fruit, you might still be over carbing it and not be doing the high fat, moderate protein, low carb paradigm. So just because it's on the list doesn't mean you can eat endless amounts of it, right? So that's one confusion people have. The other is lifestyle. And by that, and and forget the sleep and all that stuff we know is good for us, but I'm talking in terms of exercise. Often people are doing what we call chronic cardio, exercising at over 75% of their max heart rate, which is burning glucose. When you're fat adapted, you don't want to be glycolytic a lot. So the person that goes every day to the gym and runs on the treadmill for an hour at a really high pace and they're in a cardio you know, that's a person that's going to have to continue to kind of stay on that sugar burning train. So what do we do to combat that? You got to slow it down. You got to slow it down. And it doesn't feel right because in our minds we go, the harder you hit it, the more I lose weight. But actually the harder you hit it, the more your adrenals are exhausted, the more you're going to get fat around the middle. It will backfire. So it's really about chilling out with exercise. For example, I used to do hot yoga like five days a week because I figured, oh, this will torch it. This will torch the fat right here. I'm a, I mean, I'm in a hot, sweaty room. It's like 120 degrees. I'm, you know, and I'm working out for an hour and a half. No, it's that's a cortisol igniting workout when you do that every day. That is what is chronic cardio. That's what will keep you hungry and sore after a workout. And so what did I do? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I stopped that. And I also got a wrist 
continuous heart rate monitor and I started to hike slower on my hikes because I was hauling ass up the hill because again, you think the harder I go, the more I push it, the more I'm suffering on this damn thing, the better my results are going to be. And it's actually the opposite. So now it's like I go hiking with friends and I'm like, listen, we're not, I'm not doing this quick. We're doing this slow. And I'm always staying in that fat burning state. And then afterwards, not hungry for hours, not sore, not tired, nothing. So that's one component of it. So you might have someone who's like doing the, the, the diet right, but then they're running 40 miles a week at a really high pace. You know what I mean? And so they're still not getting that factor. Um, and then the other side of things too is really, this is an adrenal situation. We all, everyone's adrenals are overtaxed. We live in a very high stress society. We've got a hundred different devices and, we really have to look at that. It's not just sleep. It's like, you know, how much are you drinking coffee and jacking your adrenals? How stressed are you, you know, getting enough rest and sleep? Just lack of sleep alone can make someone gain fat around their middle because of what it does to the adrenals. So if you really want to lose weight and change your body, you have to get around sleep. And I know people that have anxiety or have issues or they're like, I'm tired all the time, I'm tired all the time. I'm like, well, what time are you going to bed? They're going to bed at 12, getting up at 6. That's not acceptable for a lot of people, especially if you've got three kids and a job. And you know what I mean? It's just not going to work out. You will crash and you will likely F up your metabolic system or some other endocrine system in your body. So it's really, really important. But there's really those kind of three components. It's diet, lifestyle, and then it's it's really looking at, you know, your stress and your and your levels of sleep and all that kind of stuff as well. So usually someone is missing a component there. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Or like they, they don't understand. They're just eating from a food list and not understanding that that has to be divvied up in a certain way. Yeah, I just uh, I find a lot of misconception that, you know, there's a lot of vegetables that uh, you're going to be eating. And, you know, people just I, for some reason have this perception that it's just meat, 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 you know, a berry once in a while. And then, you know, not that much uh, as far as vegetables. Yeah, no, a lot of vegetables and, and great fats. And yeah. um, I want to also throw this out. So there's a couple of misconceptions. One is uh, I was forgetting oh, about well, the fats, but it's funny yeah, because exactly. I don't Those even think. Really I don't, but I don't. Even, it's funny because I don't even think about them now. Right, because it's automatic that yeah. you just go for it. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions or objections is, all right, well, if cavemen were so healthy, then why is the median like average uh, age span 34 years old? Okay, that's not true. It, well, that's true, but you got to factor this in. So what they found when they, when they look at history is that if you made it beyond puberty in, the, in that time, you lived until your 80s, 90s. No health problems. Why is the average age 34 for, for cavemen? Yeah, well, people died in childbirth. If you got a cut and it got infected, goodbye. You ate the wrong berry. Forget about it. There's no mm -hmm. urgent care. You're screwed. Saber-toothed tiger. See you later. So you have to factor all that in when you're coming up with an average. But when we really look at, at our hunter-gatherer ancestors, if they made it beyond a certain age, right, you know, uh, usually puberty, they, they lasted for a long time with, with minimal health problems. Um, in fact, arthritis was not even found in the archaeological record anywhere until grains came on the scene 10,000 years ago. Wow. And so that's also what it is, too. So just for everyone out there that doesn't know, we started to really domesticate animals and start to farm around 10,000 years ago. Dairy came on the scene around 7,000 years ago, and sugar came around maybe 200-something years ago. And so before that time, there were no modern diseases. They all showed up around that time. And that's when we see it in skulls and remnants of paleontologists who can look at a skull and, and a jaw of a 60,000 year old ancestor and everything is perfectly intact. The teeth are perfect. The, 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 the skull is perfect. And then they find the skull and jawbone of a farmer from 10,000 years ago, totally eroded. Their mouth is totally eroded. That's from grains from, because grains are sugar. And also this goes back to that stereotype of English people like, Oh, English people have bad teeth. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. And that is because they were the first people to get sugar. <laughs> so if we really go back in time, you're looking at how it makes sense, how that kind of came about. You mentioned protein, that too much protein will actually turn into glucose. At what level does it turn into glucose? I'm 6'4", 205 pounds. 
what would be excessive protein for me? Because I, I'm always trying to take in protein because I'm trying to build lean muscle mass. Where am I going? Where am I going to tip the scale? Well, it just it, you really have to find your own personal protein threshold. I mean, do you know how many grams of protein you eat a day? Is it 120 what? maybe? Or? No, it's probably closer to 160 to 180. <laughs> If that works for you, then that works for you. Um, how do I know you, when it's not working for me? How do I how do I know when I turn that threshold and it goes to the other side? Is there something I can sense in you, my body? I think so. I think you at this point you would probably be intuitive enough, and if you were craving extra carbs, then that might be the time to go. Let me dial down the protein a little bit and up the fat. Hmm. I had to do that myself. I was eating overeating protein, but I'm five two, so I was eating like 120 grams of protein a day, which is probably what Mark Sissa needs. He's five eleven and he's like a ripped dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm five two female, so I was way overeating protein. Um, there's no real measurable like beyond okay. you know this gram it turns into glucose. It's just per your body, okay. but you will know because something won't be working outright. Like you'll either be gaining weight or you'll be craving something. And then that's the time to tinker with, you know, let me, let me look at the protein. Let me drop that a little bit, maybe up the fat and then stay there for like a couple weeks and see if, uh, some of those cravings or some of that, something went away. Most people like you who are fat adapted at this point on this train probably won't have an issue. And by the way, sometimes it's advantageous to overeat glucose. I mean, sorry, overeat protein. So for example, in the case of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, this is perfect. If they only had an animal and there was no other vegetation, they would eat that animal and it's, a, and it's fat. And then that, and they would overeat it if they could. And that would be like a slow release glucose mechanism. Hmm. So, for example, on the days that I really crave protein and I know I might be really going over and going to town on like a ton of beef ribs, if I know that that is going to happen, like I know, I know I'm going somewhere where that's going to be the case and I might not be able to resist overeating the meat, then I will really reduce my carbs for that day. Got it. Accountability. Let's talk about it. Why are New Year's resolutions so seldomly seen through? Well, a lot of times life just sort of gets in the way. Priorities shift and we lose sight of what's most important. We need help. If you get sick, you go to a doctor. If you have car troubles, you go see a mechanic. If you got busted pipes, my friend, you need a plumber. That's why for things that are really important that you just can't do alone, you have to call an expert. And Thor Conklin is an accountability expert. It's impossible to have accountability for achieving your larger-than-life goals all alone. It just can't work. So what do you do? Well, just like with a cough, a carburetor, or a clog, you get a hold of an expert in the field. www.thorconklin.com slash accountability. Alcohol. Mm. There's going to be somebody in the audience that goes, okay, I dig this, mm. but don't take away my martini. Mm. I'm already taking away their beer because it, please do not drink a beer. Don't drink a beer. Yeah. And if you do, there's there's at least like gluten free options for Christ's <laughs> sakes. Um, you know, I got to be honest with you. Alcohol is a tough subject for me because I personally think it's a life ruiner. I really do. Um, and it's and, and it's not that I I know very successful people that have a drink every now and then. Um, I just think it's <laughs> come on, don't sugarcoat it. I'm not sure. Okay. You know what? This is my thing to people. I go, I've never met a drunk billionaire. That's what I say to people. I've, I've never met someone who's really successful, admired and awesome. Who's a drunkie, you know, who really boozes it up unless they inherited it. Do you know what I'm saying? But then they'll probably lose it. Right. So but for the, for the most part, like I've never met anyone that rose to great successes on their own while they were also a really big drinker. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I was thinking, I have, I was thinking I that Sir I Richard Branson right now. But yeah, not, yeah, pot smokers, I've seen it, not seen it with alcohol users. Yeah, that's, not, that's I, true. I think one's a little bit better than the other. Um, this is how I feel about alcohol. Over time, it, it really is a depressant and you can't get around yeah. it. And it's not even that it'll make you depressed, but this is, I, here's the thing. I don't trust drunks. And I've said this before many times. Here's why. I mean, when I say drunks, I don't mean like obviously on the ground in an alley alcoholic, but I mean like real big drinkers, like, you know, heavy drinkers. Here's why. I've not met one that doesn't dispel someone else's secrets while they're wasted and you're talking to them. There's a great red flag for not being a friend of that person, right? And also, I just find that they are often become over time aggro, a little bit bitter. They're used to having alcohol in their system. So when it's not, they're shaky. And then they're having those hypoglycemic drops because that's what that does. And so alcohol over time will contribute to hypoglycemia if you're really abusing it. But look, I mean, you can have one, suppose for women, it's about one glass, you know, 
every 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 one glass of wine, maybe a day. For men, it could be two. Do I think it should be eliminated altogether and your life would be better? Yes. You don't have to take it away, but you're just going to have to judge your carbs. And here's the key with alcohol. If you're going to drink it, it's actually better to sort of drink it on its own. Now, I'm not saying really full empty stomach, but I am saying it's actually not as good to have it with a big meal because here's why. When you ingest alcohol, your body's first order of business is, oh shit, we need to process this and get rid of it immediately. So it's going to deal with that. And while it's dealing with that, that huge fatty meal you're eating while you're drinking is not, that's not going to be processed in the way you want it to. So that is just one tip. If you, you know, it's, it's better to have maybe eat a little bit apart from dinner, you know, maybe a few hours after is like a night cappy thing, um, or just be conscious of, um, the other thing too is alcohol. There is without getting, it's in my book, the very specifics of this, but without getting too technical, there's a reason you make bad food choices after a couple of glasses of something. Yeah. It literally will increase your appetite. So if you are in a situation where that's already a struggle, then I would suggest if you can get that component out, get it out. Yeah, yeah. And because the next, it, it's and really going to hamper that. Next day, you know, it just... That is when the cravings come on to just load up on more, more carbs, more sugar. I just, I don't know. I don't understand the people you see, like go to a bar and they'll like read a book, have a couple of drinks. I'm like, how are they comprehending this? And like really, (laughs) really, really focusing on this book. Um, If you can do it and it works for you, that's great. I mean, you know, I know several people have a glass of wine or two every night and if it works for you, fine. I've just not seen one person that has gone over that and had a, a good way with it. I like that. I've not it's met- allowed. It's allowed though. I mean, I don't want anything. It's not allowed. You know, you're allowed to have, and also there's paleo wine, by the way, I want to throw this out. So if you're going to drink wine, you should look into dry farms wines because per one liter of, of wine, it's one gram of sugar versus like 300 in a regular bottle of wine. Wow. And everyone that I know that's wine drinkers that's gone over to this because they're paleo and they're like, well, I still want to drink. And I get it. If you still want to drink, I get it. Keep your vice. Do what you got to do. But you might want to look into paleo wines. They are extremely low in sugar. They're, they're, they taste great. I've tasted several of them. And uh, Dry Farms Wines is one of the companies that does that. And they source in Europe and elsewhere. And on top of that, no sulfites, no dyes, no BS. So wine drinkers particularly, you need to look into that because a lot of the stuff that you're currently drinking is shit. Oh, yeah. So if you're going to drink, then clean it up there and there's a way to do it. Think about that. 300 grams of sugar versus one. What would you choose? Yeah. And my friends that drink this wine, um, they say, oh my gosh, there's no hangover. So try it. Like if you're going to do it and you're so like, look, I, I need my two, three glasses, then then try that version and see if that works better for you. And if you want to become a billionaire, just give it up all, all together. <laughs> well, you know what I mean by that. I, right? I, I, no, I absolutely do. You're, you're absolutely right. And look, Sir Richard Branson made his billions and then sitting on his island, he's having a cocktail. I don't think he was actually having cocktails while he was building his empire. Right. And also, he just doesn't have the profile of a guy who looks like he's boozing it up all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a good, a good good, look for anybody. No, not at all. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Share with the audience how they can get a hold of you and give a little plug on the uh, book as well. It's called The Paleo Thyroid Solution. It's on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And you can contact me at lrus.com, E-L-L-E-R-U-S-S.com. Anyone who's interested or might think they have a thyroid issue, just email or just contact me through my website because I send everybody a big full, like, here's a ton of free information, all the tests you need. You don't even have to buy my book to just contact me and get like on the right path. Um, Even though my book is great, it's inexpensive and worthwhile. But if you're kind of going, you know, I think I might, I'm not sure. How do I start investigating? Just contact me. I send everybody because, you know, part of this is that So many doctors are uninformed, and so a lot of patients spend a lot of money and get nowhere. And I know what that's like, because I spent $15,000 of my own money, and it was sick and undiagnosed for years. So for me, I'm all about giving as much free information as I can to help people get to where they need to go. So anyone can contact me there, and then I do host the Primal Blueprint podcast uh, every Wednesday. Um, And uh, yeah, social media, underscore L Russ, and yeah. Well, you're a health and life coach in this area. Who is your ideal customer? 
You mean who would be who? Who would I choose as my ideal client? Yeah, just you know, if you had to, there's going to be plenty of people listening today. Some are saying, you know, I don't know if she's the right person for me, and others yep. are, you know. Who was that ideal person? Well, you know, I, uh, maybe a couple answers to that. I'm not for everybody, of course, right? You right. know, and my, my way of coaching or speaking to someone may not be what you want, but I do give everyone a free, you know, 15 minute consultation to test out if you know they think they might want to work with me. Uh, the thing is, you're, you're gonna you're gonna hear it like it is. My nickname in college was literally no shit because they, no shit Russ, because they were like, you don't take any shit, you don't put up with any shit, you don't bullshit people, and I really don't. I don't bullshit people. People ask me a question, I tell them the truth. Now, if your eight-year-old grandmother asks me if she, I like her new hat and I hate it, of course I'm not gonna tell her. <laughs> we all have an editing button, but for the most part, you're gonna hear it from me. And so, you know, people actually really appreciate that and some people don't wanna hear that. Um, so if you come to me, you know, you're gonna get the, the, straight, the straight shooter on it. And also, I think I kind of cover a lot of ground in a shorter period of time because I feel like I can really get to it because I've been through a lot of these struggles myself in life um, versus maybe another coach who, who hasn't. Um, and obviously anyone who's really just ready to step up and do it, like enough is enough. I mean, I, I had a life coach, still do. Um, I don't talk to him as much as I did maybe 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, I think it's really great to have I mean, I do primal coaching, I do thyroid coaching, and I just do life coaching. And it just depends on, you know, if I'm right for you. But it's like, I guess to me, it's, I know that you can find happiness through your own mind and through some health adjustments and through your own, the power of your subconscious mind. And like, like what you do, some of the exercises, some of the tasks that you need to go through with micro commitments, but it's possible. And so anyone searching for that, um, sometimes coaching can be a lot better than therapy in terms of therapy can take a lot longer, or you're digging into a lot of the past, and you're spending so much time there versus life coaching, which is like, okay, we can deal with the past, but what are we doing right now? How do we start right now changing this? And I think that that is just you get so much more from that right away. That's terrific. Well, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to having you back on the show. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate your time. And I hope you found today's show valuable. If you would like to receive these shows automatically to your phone or to your computer, simply go to iTunes and subscribe. After listening to several of the shows, if you're so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating as this helps us reach additional people and spread the message. If you're truly committed to taking your life to the next level and doing whatever it takes to become a peak performer, but something's holding you back, something is blocking your way, and you just can't seem to figure out what it is, send me an email to info at thorconklin.com. And I'd be more than happy to get on the phone with you. We'll schedule a 15-minute discovery call. No obligation, no cost. I absolutely love to hear from the listeners. And if there's something I can do to help, I'd be more than happy to do that. Also, if you found something of great interest in today's show and you want to share that with your friends and family, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin. Click on the episode, hit the share button, and share it on your page. You can follow me at Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is thorconklin.com. We're constantly adding new free resources, discussing additional tricks, tips, tools, and strategies on how to be a peak performer. Remember, I try to keep these episodes short so you can listen to them during dot time, doing other things, commuting, driving, walking, working out. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day.